This has been a special week all week long. And I've just felt God having specific plans for this week. This past week leading up to this Sunday, I felt like I was really involved in a special, special way. So we all know those times where it kind of feels like you're connected in a way that doesn't happen every day. Um, there's an extra bit of love that you feel between you and God, like he's gracious enough to just pave the way. Um, when things happen, they don't seem haphazard. They seem like they're happening for a reason, or you can see, wow, this happened, and so then this. Like, everything just kind of has this plan. Well, I need to be reminded, we all need to be reminded, this is the way it is every day, even when we're not seeing it. Sometimes I think God's just good enough to let us see it. Um, so I know for a fact that God wants us to be talking about what we're talking about. I know for a fact, confident, 100% he wants us to sing the songs that we're singing today. Confident that he wants us to be here in this place and that he's chosen each of us. So sometimes we wonder, right? God, show me a little bit more. I'm not sure. Is this where I'm supposed to go, what I'm supposed to do? Is this what I'm supposed to sing or what I'm supposed to preach? Or where? We have a lot of questions, and that's fair. But even in those times we have questions, God... Is still like this. Just once in a while, he kind of like parts the curtain a little bit. It's like, take a look at what I do and how I do it. And it's just that encouragement that we need to say, okay, even when we don't feel it, God's in control. And he's amazing. And he's good. So this week, he's been gracious to me. He's let me feel it. I just know it. And just as if he wrote it on a billboard in the sky, you know, this is his week in a special kind of way. So I'm excited to be here as a church family knowing that he set it up this way. So if you're here, if I'm here, it's because he wants it. And whatever we're going to hear is exactly what he wants us to hear. And we just need to be able to be open and let him speak. It's a great confidence we can have in God. And um, he helps us. He's gracious. It's not always a mystery. Sometimes it's just clear the way things are supposed to be. So let me say a word of prayer. And then we'll dive into the word together. Father, thank you for being who and what you are. Thank you for those moments of clarity when you renew our faith and our confidence in you. Forgive us for the times where we doubt. Forgive us for the times where we just don't see what you're doing. Um, remind us when we have those times that are just inspired. Uh, that that's how you are all the time, Father, whether we feel it or not. So please work in this service. Work through your word the way that you want to, according to your plan. And uh, help us to be good followers of you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So I thought I would start with an analogy, and it has to do with kids. And it doesn't re just reply to kids, but this is a good jump off point for us. I know it's something we'll all be able to relate to. <clears throat> There's a really annoying thing that kids do. It's one of the most annoying things to me, personally. And as I was thinking about this week, I was realizing it's not just kids. This is one of the things that really gets under my skin when people do this in general. And I can think back to like, as far back as I can remember, and remember times where people did this and it just drove me crazy. It's when you say something or tell them something and they just say no. When you're making sense and they're just contradicting you for the sake of contradicting you. When you're trying to explain something and the person you're talking to just doesn't believe what you're saying. They're like, well, no, I'm just telling you what I'm telling you. And they say, no, that's not how it is. With kids, this can be, it's daytime. And they're like, no. You can fight over that. They're like, no, it's daytime. No, it's not. But with adults, maybe it's a little more subtle. But the feeling of talking to someone, not sharing an opinion, but just sharing something that's true, that's real, and having them say, no, that's not the way it is. I see it differently. No, that's not it. It's really frustrating because you feel like you can see the truth for what it is. Why can't they see this thing too? And yet they're not taking your word for it. They're clearly wrong. You see the truth, but they don't. And they don't accept your word for it. You can say to a child something, well, this is how this works. I'm like, no, that's not how that works. They're saying, I need you to prove it to me before I believe what you say. Show me, parents. Convince me. Prove to me that what you're saying is true. You tell someone something else, maybe not a child, maybe in work or whatever, and they say, no, that's not how it is. Like, no, really, that's how it is. Like, no, that's not how it is. They're saying, I don't take your word for it. I do not believe you just because you said it. I do not trust that what you're saying is true. I believe myself over you. And for you to convince me, it's going to take you overriding all my thoughts on the matter, 
to prove that you're right. Prove it to me. Show it to me, and then I'll believe it. Convince me, and then I'll believe it. When kids do this to us as parents, it's showing a lack of faith in us. They do not believe that we are telling them the truth. They believe that we need to explain to them why we're saying and what it means and how it works and what the truth is, and then they'll agree to it. There needs to be a, a much greater level of trust, I think, between a child and a parent. You should be able to believe your parents when they tell you something. And if your parent says, well, this is really how it is, it should be something you can say, okay. When we know something to be a fact and we share and someone doesn't believe us, they're showing a lack of faith in us. It's a lack of faith to believe someone who is an authority or has knowledge. And you obviously don't because in this scenario you're wrong, but you're willing to fight against someone who does have knowledge because you're not sure. So you're willing to fight from a place of ignorance against someone who's in a place of knowledge because you don't trust that what they would say would be true. Don't have faith in them. Well, the clear, obvious parallel is that we do this with God all the time. We say, show me, and then I'll believe. But what about this, and what about this, and what about this? Convince me, God, so that I can understand how this works, and then I'll do what you want. Prove it to me. How do I know that you're saying this? Give me a sign. Show me something. And in those moments, we're showing a lack of faith in God because we're not saying, oh, I just trust you to do what you're going to do. It's, well, these are my thoughts of the matter, or here's my question. Show up. Prove it. And we ask God, okay, show me what your will is in these sorts of things. And we read the scripture. We say, Holy Spirit, lead me. And we feel little leadings to do this or to say this or not. Those are the good things that we do. But the not so great, not so healthy things we do spiritually are when we ask God for his opinion, and then we feel a thought come to our mind, and then we debate it. Yeah, but... I don't know about that. Yeah, but what about this? And what about this? And yeah, I, I get that. Okay, I, mean, I probably should do this. That's like the Christian thing to do. Or maybe that's what... But what about this and this and this? These are the extenuating circumstances. Prove to me, God, that this is what you want. We don't just take him at his word. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Just like... Trust. Faith. Now, our faith is not a blind faith because we see God work all the time. And when we put his teachings into practice in our lives, we see the fruit. We know we've experienced things like peace, and we know we've felt him work things out in kind of this amazing way, so we know that God is at work. But there's also a lot of times that we doubt, and there's a lot of questions that we have. I know I'm thinking about Kaylee, and we've been talking and praying for her for so long. We'd love to have God explain why it's taking so long for this process to go. Can you just explain it to us? Or show us the clear way to get out of this and to move past this. In those moments, we have to be careful. And it's not just that situation. It's every situation. Should we or shouldn't we have more children? Should we or shouldn't we sell our home? Should we or shouldn't we reach out to this person in this way? Should we or shouldn't we reconcile with this person that we have friction with? Show me, God. Just give me a sign. All right, I'm going to close my eyes, God. And when I open them, the first thing that I see is going to be your sign to me for what I should do. It's a clock. I'm supposed to wait. Okay, it's not time. That's fine. We would love it if, like Josh said, the heavens open and the angels descend. Sell your home, not Friday, but next Tuesday. I'm confident in this past week that God has spoken to me about these things. Like I said, the service just feels like, and this week feels like his plan, but he didn't open any heavens for me this week. No angels descending on magical ladders and... Nothing like that. I just know. I know. I see him at work. I feel it. I see how things fit together. I read and I feel like those, those moments of like, oh. You just feel him leading along. So God communicates in all sorts of ways. But we often find ourselves in a place where we're not sure what he's saying. I'm there. You're there. We're all there at times, right? So it's not that we don't believe in him or that we have no faith at all. Even with faith, we get into those places where maybe the situation is more drastic than we've ever encountered before. Or maybe it just, we have no experience with this, we don't know how to walk through this thing. So we're going to hit those places where we say, God, tell us. That's fine, that's normal. He wants to lead us like sheep. But why is it that we have such a hard time hearing what he's saying? 
So the title for the sermon today is Hearing God Speak. And the question I think that I and all of us run into sometimes is why aren't I hearing him? Why can't I hear him? And maybe some of you are hoping that I'm going to give you the secret for how to hear God speak. The secret. Ready for it? There's no secret. It's simple. God's speaking all the time. I have no secret to give you. I have a challenge to give you. If God's speaking all the time, why are you having such a hard time listening? Let's put the focus where it needs to be. Back on our inadequacy, not on God's failure to communicate or to reveal or to speak. It's a better question, isn't it? We can go blaming God all day for why he's not answering our problems, but is he really not answering them? Are we just having trouble listening? Maybe we're debating with him. Maybe we're in the show me, convince me, explain to me, prove to me mode. <clears throat> and if we just kind of simplify it all and back to the beginning, it would be very obvious what he's trying to say. Maybe not, because there are times where God makes you wait, but then that's the obvious answer too. He's not answering. It's just time to wait. Instead of, what about this and this and this? We get ourselves wrapped up in how do I hear God as if it's a skill that you could learn. It's more about how can I unplug my ears and get all this accumulated wax out of there so that I can actually hear what is happening. God is speaking. He is. He is. The question is, why aren't we hearing him? That's on us. That's not on God. So let's use another metaphor for God. As he's revealed himself to be kind of this plural entity, you know, we looked at the Old Testament, the word for God, Elohim, plural. So he's not the gods, he's God, but in like kind of a many sort of way. We described it using water. When you hold a cup of water, it's not a water, it's water, and there's a complexity to it, and there's a plurality to it, but it's still one thing. And so Jesus, God, water, spirit, God, God the Father, God, but not a single thing, not even just three things. God, as a being that's just meant to kind of blow our minds. So it's not for us to understand, but it's a way for us to try to grasp. So here's another metaphor for us to try to understand God a little bit better. It's speech itself. When we're talking about communication. Think about what would happen if we only ever thought things and never said anything. No communication happens, right? If we think all the time, man, I love my wife, but we never say it, she never knows it. It's, it's, it's an unborn, an unliving thing. It's just the thought. You could think of God the Father as that way. The thought, the, the mind, the source. Jesus is called the words. That's a pretty easy parallel to make. He is the words spoken. He speaks the word of God. Before Jesus was born and became incarnate, this word of God, this Logos, was in the beginning speaking things into being, just like Jesus speaks things into our lives now. So God's thoughts through this word of God. But if we just have the thoughts and the words with no breath of God, then it sounds like this. There's no projection. There's no breath carrying the thoughts of God and the words of God into being. And that's exactly what we see the Holy Spirit being. Breath of God. Inspiration of God. Mind of God communicated to us. God in us. The thoughts. So we all communicate this way too, right? We think before we speak, right? I hope. Please try it. You'll like it. Your family will like it. Think before you speak. The Bible says to do this. This is not something to debate. Do this. Think. And then speak. But project. Speak those words into being. Breathe life into those words. So it's not just empty mouthing of words. It's living them. This is how God communicates to us. And in thinking about God and his communication with us, this is probably a helpful thing for us to just think about today in terms of communication. You want to know the mind of God. You want to know the words of Christ. You want to feel the breath and the moving of the Spirit. That's all God. And any one of those, just like we talked about, you end up with an incomplete communication, a, a sort of faulty way of going about it. So, are we praying to know the mind of God? Are we reading to know the words of Christ? Are we listening to feel the moving of the Spirit? These are the sorts of ways that you think about God communicating, the ways that then we approach Him to hear Him communicate to us. And I think it's very similar to the way that we communicate too, which makes sense because we are made in the image of God. We should see parallels all the time because He's made us like Him. 
That doesn't answer the question, though, of why we don't actually hear him communicating. This may be how it might work. It's a way to think about it. But if you would flip over to 1 Corinthians, please, chapter 1. Um, I'd like to listen to the Apostle Paul. Now, we know his story, right? He did hear Christ speak from the sky, like out of this blinding light, the voice of Christ saying, why are you persecuting me? And struck him blind. So he's had that kind of experience in his life. In his writings, we see that he's had moments where he just felt the spirit lead. And it was just a nudge, an urge, a, a conviction, a gut instinct. You know, how do you put the your hand on it? You can't. But he felt God and he followed through on that, both with the people in his lives and himself personally. So he's experienced all of these things. And yet he's writing this letter to a church and recognizes the people in Corinth they're not all in the same place. They're not all hearing God speak to them. They're not all listening well. And so what advice does he give as someone who's been there and done that, someone who God has chosen to teach through him? Um, this is how he goes about it. So I'd kind of like to read through this. Maybe we'll stop here and there and highlight a place uh, or two. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, we'll start with verse 18. Paul says, the message of the cross, so the fact that God would die on a cross for us and forgive us, extend grace, pay our penalty, offer us peace, give us his spirit, those sorts of things. The message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it's the power of God. So two people look at the same situation. To one, it's ridiculous. And to the other, it's inspiring. But this is actually a fulfillment of what the prophet said a long time ago for this. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the intelligence of the intelligent. I will frustrate. So Paul says, where is the wise man? Show me this person who is this intellectual genius. Where is the scholar, the person who has all the education in the world? Where is the philosopher, the person who can think circles around the people around them? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? All of our earthly wisdom, our education, our intellectual power, God says that is foolish. You have nothing. That is not where it's at. That's all dead-end stuff. That's worldly stuff. It dies away. Since in the wisdom of God, this is his plan, the world can't meet him through wisdom. The world through its wisdom cannot know him. God was actually in a very opposite way, pleased through the foolishness of a cross, of a dead Savior, an arisen Savior. He's pleased through that foolishness of the cross to save those who believe despite it. God says, you do not have to pay for your errors, your mistakes, the things you're guilty of, if you trust me that I can take care of that for you. You say, I believe. It's like the father to the child. So you're going to make something that already happened go away? No, I don't believe that can happen. You have to trust me. That's what I'm saying. This is what God is saying. The cross is true. The message of the empty cross is true. So it saves those who can believe despite it being opposite to our intellect. So here's our sentence, our key verse. Jews demand miraculous signs. Greeks look for wisdom. But we preach Christ killed, murdered, crucified. And this is a stumbling block to Jews. It's like an anti-sign from God. And it's foolishness to Gentiles because it has no wisdom, no human wisdom in it. And here's where we go right back to the beginning. When God says, this is what I've done for you, we can debate it and we can say, prove it to me. We can say, show me. We can say, convince me. We can go through all those things. He's not going to do that. I think that's the point. <laughs> it takes us giving up our desire to make God prove himself, giving up our desire to understand it all, giving up all of the questions that we, we hold on to to demand an answer before we go to that next place in our faith. We need to give up those things. Because then this thing, which doesn't make sense, which God is doing, can actually change everything. So look for signs. You know, show me, God. 
No, he says Jews do this. And as a nation, we can look back and see all the signs that God delivered to the Jewish people based on his graciousness. Like the Red Sea, pretty good sign that God's on your side. Waters part, nation through, kill the Egyptians, off you go. Like, pretty clearly a God thing because he chose in that moment to do that. If you get accustomed to seeing God do these miraculous things every day, then you get into the promised land, and you're like, things are good. Where's the sign? Where is this God? He says, don't make me prove myself to you. When you need me, I'll be there with those proofs, but don't demand the signs. Greeks, their culture was all about wisdom. Plato, Aristotle, Socrates, all these people in this Greco-Roman time period some of the most profound thoughts that have shaped the rest of civilization came out of that time. So much of our education, so much of our everything is built on simple proverbs and thoughts from that time. Greek wisdom. They were good at it. Better at it than we are. Probably the best ever. It's what they were. And so God says, you're not going to get to heaven by how smart you are. So I'm going to give you something that you think is ridiculous. And you know what? It's not logical. So you're going to have to be willing to put your logic to the side, stop thinking you're so amazing at these lofty thoughts that you can think, and just take me at my word. And I'm not going to explain it to you. I'm not going to convince you. I'm not going to do all these miraculous signs to try to win you over. This is true. I'm the dad. I say so. Believe it. Trust me. So then we get an opportunity to show faith or not. Maybe it's a small step of faith. Or maybe, that's the question. So the gospel isn't looking to convince or to show or to prove. Those things come with it, but that's not how God works. So we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those whom God has called, the people who feel that tug from God, both Jews and Greeks, doesn't matter, man, woman, old, young, anything. Christ is the power of God, and he's the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than man's wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than man's strength. Brothers, sisters, think back to what you were when you were called, when you first felt that tug by God. Not many of us are wise by human standards. Not many of us are influential. Not many of us are of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. It's like, what's that phrase, um, out of the mouths of babes, when a small child can say something more profound than you ever could have thought of? They're not speaking from their vast wisdom and experience. They just said the truth, and it came out like, wow. And it humbles us, the parents who think that we're so smart, and then this word came out like, mm, you just taught me something, two-year-old. That's us to God. That's us to each other. It's our humility and God's power that makes it work. The foolishness of God is wiser than man's wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than man's strength. Verse 28, he, God, chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things, the things that are not, to nullify the things that are, so that no one may boast before him. Put the pride to the side. It's because of him that you are in Christ Jesus, who has become for us wisdom from God. That is our righteousness, our holiness, our redemption, Christ from God to us, for us. Therefore, as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. Paul says, when I came to you, people in Corinth, church, I didn't come with eloquence or superior wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. I resolved to know nothing while I was with you, except Jesus Christ and him crucified. So I came to you in weakness and in fear and with much trembling. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words. He didn't like win them over or convince them to salvation, but it was with a demonstration of the Spirit's power. God showed himself to these people through the preaching, through the word, through his moving, so that their faith, and ours too, might not just rest on men's wisdom, but on God's power. If we've been convinced into the faith by someone smarter than us, there's every reason to believe we could be convinced out of it by someone smarter than us as well. So if our faith base is based on our knowledge, our knowledge will grow and change. We'll read more books, see more documentaries on TV, have more skeptical friends over the years that will introduce thoughts that then make us feel like, well, how can I understand it all? And how can I answer this? And now I don't know everything. I felt content with what I knew, and now I feel like I don't know. And our faith is not based on our wisdom and on our knowledge. Same thing with signs. Show me, God. 
You have a moment, we all must have someone we can look back in our lives and say, at this moment, God just did an amazing thing. But if that's the only thing you have is like those, maybe a childhood memory or a miraculous way that you, you know, a near car crash or something, you can look today and wonder, is that really a sign from God? Or maybe it's just a coincidence. If we're basing it on signs, then the absence of signs is the absence of conviction, the absence of assurance of faith, the absence of confidence in your relationship with God. Because signs and knowledge aren't actually faith. They're the opposite of faith. We don't need God to explain himself to us. We just need to believe what he's said, and he'll show us more as we go. We don't need him to give us, you know, a light from heaven and the choirs of angels singing the answer to our question. We need to see and pray, God, what's your mind on this? And I'd say, what have you said through your word? What is Jesus saying? Jesus, speak your words to me right now. What are the right words? And spirit, move me, like lead me, push me in the direction that you want me to go. We'll read a little bit more, but just on this thought before we do. There's a difference between saying, God, prove it to me or show me, and saying, God, reveal it to me. The second is healthy, is godly, is spiritual. Reveal to me, God. The first is worldly, is personal. Prove it to me or convince me. So think about those two differences for a moment. Um, if I say, God, prove to me what you're saying or show me, convince me of this thing, then I'm saying I need him to justify himself to me and to convince me and you know, show all those sorts of things. So that becomes about me. But if I say, God, reveal to me what you want, it shifts back to him as the focal point and he's not satisfying me. He's revealing actually what is. Everything in this world that's against him, we say, is a lie. That Jesus is the truth. The Spirit is truth. So God's like the only one that actually knows how things really are. And so him showing us the way is kind of like revealing, like opening the door a little bit. And like, Look through this door. See, that's how things really are. He does this for us sometimes. He says, this is who you really are. And sometimes we're like, wow, you've really made me a compassionate person. The things he shows about us are affirming. Sometimes it's, man, I'm a really judgmental person. I didn't realize that. But he's showing the truth. It's not like, give me a sign, God, to tell me what. It's, show me a little bit more of the truth of the situation, what really is, so we can walk through it. Karl Barth, a famous um, Christian theologian, <clears throat> had a way that he described God, the three parts of the Trinity, using revelation, using revealing as the key point. I love it. it person is just like a great way to think about it. So here it is. God the Father is the revealer. He's the one who reveals. He's the only one that knows true truth, and he will reveal it to his people when it's time for them to do this or when they need to watch out for this or whatever. Christ is the thing revealed, the word. It's the truth. Here it is. You know, it's not just some invisible God. God became flesh to show us that thing revealed. God revealed to us the word revealed when things happen. And then the Holy Spirit is revelation, the actual aha moment we have when things become clear. You can't have that aha moment if it's not spoken or become real, and it can't happen unless there's a God who desires to reveal, but they are one without each other it doesn't make sense either. So the same way that communication, thought, words, breath, revelation, the revealer, the thing revealed, and then revelation for us. I just love how that lays it out, another way to think about God. But for us, it's very healthy, very good to say, God, reveal to me the truth. Because then we're not saying, this is my desired outcome. I want a new car. I want this job. I need these things. Show to me what I should do. It's more like, God, there's actually a reality that I'm unaware of. And there's things that you want to accomplish. And there's things that you want to teach me. Show me those things. Reveal. Revelation. I want that. I don't necessarily want proof that what I'm about to do is what you... Don't convince me. Don't give me a sign. Okay, if I look outside and there's three birds on the telephone pole, I'll know that that means that you want me to make a right at the next light and stop and talk to the first person I meet. And God can do those things, but that's got to be his initiative. We're not allowed to say, all right, God, here are my stipulations. Show me the signs. That's not faith. That's looking for proof. So reveal, awesome. God, reveal truth to me. Because sometimes the truth he reveals is exactly opposite of what you wanted. But if it's the real truth, the true truth, we take it, and we grow from it, and it's good, even if it's not what we wanted. So, back here to our passage, verse 6, says, We do speak, however, a message of wisdom. So we are speaking something, Paul says, and he and the apostles, he means, Christians, he means, 
Um, but we're not speaking the wisdom of this age or the rulers of this age. No, we're speaking of God's secret wisdom. Who knows the mind of God? Just God. So we're speaking through the Word, through the Holy Spirit, God's wisdom that's been hidden, that God destined for our glory in this time that Jesus and the Holy Spirit would be revealed. None of the rulers of this age understood it. You know, the Pharisees and the people who put Christ to death, we would have been there probably with them. None of the rulers of this age understood it. Because if they had, they wouldn't have crucified the Lord of glory. However, as it is written, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed it to us by his Spirit. The Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. The Spirit, the breath of God, searches God. Who among men knows the thoughts of a man except the man's spirit within him? Who knows our thoughts except us? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God, but we haven't received the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God. So that we may understand what God has freely given us. This connection with him, this forgiveness, this oneness with God. This, Paul says, is what we're speaking about. Not in words taught by the spirit, expressing spiritual to... No, sorry. Not in words taught by human wisdom, but in words taught by the spirit, expressing spiritual truths in spiritual words. Right? Truth again. The man without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, their foolishness. So for those of us, or people in our families, that are skeptical of the things of God, that's probably logical. They're just relying on their logic, and some of these things don't make sense. But that lacks faith. It lacks the Spirit. The man without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from God, their foolishness. That's the way God's planned it. It's supposed to be foolishness so that our wisdom doesn't lead us to salvation. He said, this, uh, Paul says, these things are spiritually discerned. So the spiritual man makes judgments about all things, but he himself is not subject to any man's judgment because we're judged only by God. Who has known the mind of God that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. So that's the message. That's the mystery. That as the Jewish people are following God and wondering, where is he leading? What is he going to do? How can we follow these commandments more faithfully and do the right thing all the time? And when we, can, when we fail and sin, how can we confess those sins and you know, do the right sacrifices to atone for them? The mystery and the secret of it is that God can give us his mind so that we can begin to think like him. And that he offers this forgiveness that as long as we just trust him that what he says is true, he takes it from there. It's trusting in him. But it's hard to do because everything in us is going to want to understand it more. Everything in us is going to want to make sure, you know, be a wise buyer before you purchase. Do your homework. Read the consumer reports. Make sure you make a wise decision. Following God isn't as much about making a decision as it is letting go of the things that are stopping us. Letting go of the things that block us from God. Letting go of the things that God wants to do in us but that we're holding on to. I've said before, and I don't know, I've probably said it to some of you, I feel like every great story that I've heard from the Christian people I know both here and elsewhere, every great story begins with, I finally gave up and said, God, do whatever you want to do. Why don't I hear about all these great Christian stories where people say, I finally understood. I finally got God. He made sense to me. And then I went and I did this, and he blessed it. Why don't more great stories say it? And then I, I got this great sign from heaven and it said, do this. And the next day I got this other sign. This Those things happen, but faith is about letting go of our need to know. We don't need to know everything. God does, so we can just trust him. And we pray, and he speaks that breath, that inspiration into our hearts and our minds, and we know something. We say, thank you, God, for revealing that. You just revealed to me. And we read in the Word and say, Jesus said this, and then we start the debate. Yeah, but what about this? And if we're willing to put down the debate, we can actually trust Christ for what he said to be true. That's the beginning of faith, and then from there it grows. So I think the beginning of every good story starts with, all right, God, I give up my desire to have it proven to me or to know for a fact. Show me. Reveal to me your truth. So bring it all the way back to the beginning. God's, the thought, God the Father, the thoughts of what we need to know. Are you praying and asking, our Father who art in heaven, show me, reveal to me your will, thy will be done? 
If we have these questions, if we're in this place where we, we aren't hearing from God, are we reading what he's already said through prophets, through Moses, through Christ, through Paul? It's his spirit leading and putting these things down so we can learn from them, gain wisdom. Are we doing that? Are we waiting and, and listening for that moving of the spirit, which is this intangible thing, but it's very real, and you know it when you feel it. This is the right thing to do. I knew I should make that call. I knew I should do this thing. I know I should send that card. I knew I should confess this sin. I knew I should mend that broken bridge. Or are we praying and hearing from God and saying, yeah, but? Are we reading and saying, yeah, but? And are we feeling this movement and saying, yeah, but? God's not having any trouble communicating. If we're in this place, we're not hearing anything either. He's just saying, wait. And in that case, we recognize and say, okay, I'll patiently wait. You're in charge. You got this. But if we're in that fight, the debate, the internal war, that's not a place of peace. That's not just God saying, wait. We're fighting with him or ourselves in some way. So we need to pray. We need to read. We need to listen. And then God can really communicate as long as we're not saying, prove it, show me, convince me. Just reveal to me your will. So I'd like to ask the music team to, actually just Josh, would you come forward to close us in a song? I'd like to ask everybody just to bow your heads for a moment. Let's just take a moment of silence. Whatever it is that you feel God convicting you of, we say, Father, speak to me. <laughs> then listen. Listen to what he has to say. Um, I know for a fact he has things he wants to say to us this morning. So please, please listen. Don't ignore, don't debate. Just say, your will be done.